So now we should take a look at how you as a programmer can actually use these services Unix provides, for example, to input and output information and especially to create processes, to handle processes and so on. So first we should look at how you as a programmer writing application programs are actually able to request a service from the operating system. So if you're just writing C code from the point of view of your application, if you want to call an operating system service, that just looks like a regular function call. So we usually print uh, every system function here in blue, but of course, uh, well, that's just for indication here. So it looks like you would just call a regular function called fork. It doesn't get any parameter and it returns some value which we store in a variable called PID or PID. So uh, that's not as easy as it looks on the inside it's because if you would be able to arbitrarily call code inside of the OS kernel, that would be very dangerous because then you'd just be able to call any function inside of the kernel. So you wouldn't be able to check permissions to execute a function. So you could maybe delete someone else's files. Uh, the kernel wouldn't be able to check for correct parameters. Uh, so this would be a real big security nightmare. So essentially, if you want to call a system function, there must be something else behind this simple abstraction again that we say oh it just looks like a C function and so essentially what's behind calling a system service or a system function is that you need to transition from a mode where code is executing inside of your application where you're very constrained in the things you do so your regular application cannot for example delete any arbitrary file on disk or it cannot reboot your computer uh, but of course your kernel needs to be able to do this. So you need some sort when you execute a system function here to transition from code running inside of your application to code that has the privileges which is running inside of the operating system kernel. And this transition needs to be protected. So it's not just a simple jump instruction to jump anywhere, but there needs to be some gateway which you have to pass through and at this gateway you are checked if you're the process being allowed to do this function, if you're bringing all the correct parameters and only then the operating system will fulfill uh, yeah, the operation you have requested. So uh, this transition to be protected needs some sort of hardware support and many processes actually provide several execution modes. So you can have, have at least two execution modes if you want to have this sort of protection, one mode is a so-called user mode. So in user mode, only your applications run. So very restricted functionality is allowed. As I said, you are unable, for example, to reboot your computer. And in kernel or supervisor mode, you usually have full access to all hardware resources of your computer. So you can format your hard disk in the kernel if you like. You can reboot your machine. You can send any network packets you like, whatever. So this can be very dangerous, obviously. And on the machine code level, there are special machine code instructions provided to enable this transition from user to kernel mode. So when a user mode program requests a system service, it has to ex uh, execute the special machine instruction and then your processor actually takes care of doing this transition and then it jumps to a very well specified location inside of your kernel. So there's one thing we call an entry point, so one function inside of your kernel. And the first thing this function does is check are you actually allowed to uh, execute this function and are your parameters correct? And if not, well, the kernel will not do what you request. Uh, so this special machine instruction uh, cannot usually be generated by a C compiler. So it's usually generated by some sort of assembler code that you add, usually by writing a short piece of assembler code or by using something called inline assembler where you can specify short sequences of assembler inside of your C code. And the name of this instruction and the exact functionality depends on the processor you use. So on old 32-bit Intel machines, it would be in software interrupt hexadecimal 80. On more modern Intel and AMD 64-bit machines, there are special instructions called syscall or sysenter. On Motorola 68K machines, this would be trap. On ARM processors, this is called a supervisor call. And on RISC-V, this is an e-call, an external call. And as I said, executing such an instruction actually means something special for the CPU. So if you execute, for example, a syscall instruction, your processor stops executing your program. It 
jumps to a specified location inside of the kernel, changes its execution mode to supervisor mode, so the kernel has all the privileges, and then of course the kernel starts running, and the kernel needs to be very careful to check all the parameters, if they're correct, if you have all the permissions, and then can execute your function. And this execution of such an instruction by providing additional information about which function of the kernel do you want, which parameters do you want, and so on. This is what we call a system call. So system calls work like this. You're in your user process executing your code, and then you figure out you need some system functionality. Now, in early Unix systems, then you'd really add this, for example, this call or int AD instruction directly as a machine instruction at the location you want to run your, uh, to use your system function. Now this is very inconvenient because maybe the numbers of your system calls changes because somebody did a reallocation. So if this is fixed in your code, you need to recompile your code or rewrite your code. Or maybe the whole system interface changes. So a program using direct system calls is not very portable across different Unix systems. So what's usually done is that there's a sort of shim or stubs provided by the standard C library. And uh, so the standard C library has functions like your fork function you've seen on the previous slide. And these functions are stops. So they're actually very short sequences of code, which then take care of calling the system on your behalf. So this is a bit of a redirection, but this means if something changes in your system call interface, the only thing you need to change in your system is ellipse C, so your standard C library. And this is a library usually linked to all of your programs. And in modern Unix systems, this is not statically linked, so this is not part of your executable, but it's dynamically linked. So if you update your C library, all of your programs are enabled to use, for example, a new system call functionality or a new system call standard or whatever. So essentially, when you run a user, user process and you execute something that looks like a function call, usually this calls into libc, into a libc stub, and then libc does the actual system call instruction, then your CPU changes your mode to the kernel mode, your system call is executed after your permissions and your parameters have been verified, and then eventually the kernel returns using a special instruction which switches back from kernel to user mode, and then your program can continue where it left off, so it will return from your libc stop and then continue after you called your libc functions. So this makes life a bit more flexible and easy. So in case you were wondering, are there actually direct system calls inside of your code? Usually not, but you can still do this today. So we can maybe add an additional inter uh, 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 just exercise for those who are interested, which is not part of the grading, obviously, where you can experiment with directly calling a system call. So which system calls do we have? So a modern Unix system like Linux has several hundreds of system calls for all sorts of functionality. Today we are going to look at process management only and the most important process control system calls are listed on this slide here. So these are available on all Unixes, no matter if you use Mac OS X, a BSD system, Linux, or the Windows subsystem for Linux uh, on Windows 10. So what functionality does a system provide? Which syscalls are available? So the first one is getPit. We've already seen every Unix process has a unique process ID, as, which is assigned when the process is started. So when you want to figure out what is my process ID, you can call getPit. So getPit returns the process ID of the process that called it. So the process ID executing this getPit system call. So when you are talking about Unix functions and system calls, you usually see this number in brackets here. This is not a parameter that's passed, so this is just an indication that you can find more information about getPit in the Unix manual, and this Unix manual has several sections, one, two, three, four, five, so getPit would be contained in the section of the Unix manual, which is section two, and section two is the section of the Unix manual describing all system calls, whereas section three, for example, would be the section con uh, describing your libc calls available. So uh, if you want to read this manual page information in the Unix manual, it's all online on Unix, obviously, because you can always find it on the net nowadays. So you can type man 
than the number of the chapter, two, and weight. You don't always need to have to enter this number, but in some cases there are different sections of the Unix manual with a command that has the same name. For example, you can have weight as a system call and weight might also be functionality of the shell. So you'd have a man page, for example, in section one, which describes shell commands for weight and a man page in section two. So by giving this number here, you know you're getting the man page uh, section which describes system calls, so the system call for weight. So what else do we have here? We have another system call called get PPID. So uh, you maybe want to know who is your parent. Well, uh, as a process, so you can call get PPID and so the operating system returns you the process ID of the process that created you, usually your parent PID. This may be a different one. We'll see one of the situations later in exceptional cases. Then we've seen processes are started by users. So if you logged in as a user to your Unix system, you have a user ID, which is also a numerical ID, like the process IDs, so a number from zero to many. And if you want to know as a programmer, which user has started me or under which user's ID am I running, you can execute a call called get UID, so it gets the user ID. And now some interesting functions are coming. So the first function is called fork. So fork actually is the way to create a new process in Unix. So it calls a new child process. We've already seen parent and child process before. And fork is the system call you'd execute if you need another process to do something. Of course, sometimes you want to exit from your program. So there's an exit function, but this is in section three, as you see. So this is a libc function. And this libc function does some additional cleanup, actually. The exit function of the operating system itself as a system call, you see it's in section two, is called underline exit. And this underline exit just exits your process immediately without cleaning up. So it doesn't close any files, it doesn't write any buffers and so on. So usually you want to use the libc function exit, which takes care of cleaning up after the process. But if you for some reason need to exit immediately, you can call the underline exit call as a system call. Now, if you've created child process, maybe you wanted this child process to do some work for your process. So you need to figure out when has it finished executing its task. So there's a system call called wait, and this wait tells my process, if I created a child process, please wait until this child process has terminated and we can continue whenever it has terminated so we know the task of this child process. For example, printing a file has been terminated, now we can continue doing something else. Now the problem is, or the uh, very uh, special situation in Unix is, uh, that you actually can create new processes using fork but fork creates a child process, and this child process is almost identical to the process that called you, uh, that, that created it. So what this means is that using fork alone, you can just create almost identical copy of the process that called it. Now that's not very useful because you want to execute different programs. And so there's an additional system called, called execve, and this is a system call that loads and starts a program in the context of the calling process. So whenever you start execve and you give this a parameter for the program you want to execute, the program that calls execve is kicked out of memory and instead with the same process ID, a new process is now running, which is the process you've just started. So this is a very unusual thing. So what you do is to create or to run a new program, you'd create a copy of yourself using fork and then this copy can replace itself by a new program by calling this execve system call. We'll see in a bit why this makes sense. So let's first look at the fork system call. So fork has this uh, signature here. So the name of the system call is fork, even as we've seen. It's a C prototype essentially for the libc function. And we see fork doesn't get any parameters, so it's void, it's empty, but it returns something, and this something is a pit t. So pit t is a type def uh, 
for usually some sort of integer variable. So a process ID in Unix is usually an unsigned integer number. So what fork does is when you call fork your operating system takes the process that is calling it and duplicates it. So you have two copies of fork and they're almost identical. So the child process inherits the address space, so all of the code, all of the data, the BSS and stack segments of the process that called fork. It inherits its user and group ID. It inherits its standard I.O. channels, even if they're redirected. It inherits other information like a process group and signal tables, so we'll discuss this later. Oh. It inherits uh, open files and the current working directory. So as you see, this is from a set of German slides, which I neglected to translate this line. We'll see more about this later. So let's look at one of the system calls we use to manage processes. And one of the most important system calls, as we've seen, is fork. So on top of here, we show the prototype of fork. Essentially, this is a prototype of the libc function but just see it as an abstraction for a system call. So fork gets no parameters, so it's void inside of our brackets here, and it returns something that is a PIT T, so a process ID data type. And this is usually in most Unix systems an unsigned integer variable, but we have typed def this to a PIT T, so it's clear that it's always the semantics of a process ID that is returned. So as we've already seen, fork duplicates the calling process, which is a standard way to create a new process in Unix. And duplicating means it inherits almost everything of the process that calls it. So when we call fork, our operating system makes a copy of a lot of things. So the address space, it copies the code, data, the BSS and stack segments. Also the user and group IDs are identical in your child process as in the process that has called fork. The standard IO channels are the same. So if there was a IO redirection, for example, uh, of our parent process, the child also inherits this redirection. Some things like process group and signal tables, and also the files you've opened, your current working directory and so on. There are only a few things that are unique to your child process. So not copied are the Process ID, of course, we said there may be only one process having a given process ID at any time. So our child process needs a new process ID. And of course, it has a different parent than the process that calls it. So it also gets a different parent process ID. And some other things like pending signals, we'll talk about signals later, and maybe some accounting data for how much time it has used on a CPU and so on. These are actually provided individually for your child process. So what happens when you call fork is after you return from fork, you return in the original program, your parent process that has called fork, but you have a new process, your child process, and this also returns at the exact same location. So one process calls fork, but when you return from your system call, you have two processes that both return to the same location in code. And that's a bit strange, right? So this is something you've got to get used to when using Unix. And this is one of the very unique things that were introduced by Unix, I think. So how do you use fork? So here we have an example program, which is yeah, just a main pro, uh, function, which gets no parameters. And here we declare an integer variable pit. So this could also be a pit t variable, but it also works for an integer variable. And the first thing we want to do is what is our own process ID? What is the parent process ID? So we print, we are in parent, and then we use the uh, replacement syntax here of our formatting strings. So we have a process ID of whatever is returned by get pit and a parent process ID of whatever is returned by our system called get pro parent process ID. So you see these system calls here just look like regular C function calls, but in fact, they call the system. Okay, and then we want to create a child process. This means we just call fork, and fork doesn't get any parameters as we've seen, but it returns a process ID. So the process is duplicated inside of the kernel, and then a new user process is created. When you call fork, and when we return, you return twice. So once you return your parent process, so it looks like a regular function call, and once you have a copy of that exact function here, and this also returns from fork, 
returning a process ID. So the question is now, how can we know this is exactly the same code if we're in the parent or if we're in the child process? So this is one of the things that's actually changed between the parent and the child process. So for the parent process, we are returned the process ID of the child that was just created. So fork returns to the original process that calls it the process ID of the new process that was created. So as a parent process, we immediately know the process ID of our child. So we know who our child is. And if you're the child process that has a copy of that main function, then you return a zero. So the zero, we've seen zero is a very special process, the very first process. This cannot be created as a child process for anyone. So zero indicates that we're in the child process. So we can make use of this, that this process ID differs between parent and child process, by just checking for the value of PIT afterwards. So if this value of PIT is not zero or larger than zero, because process IDs are always positive, then we know we're in the parent process because we got returned a process ID. And this process ID we can print. This is our child process ID of the child that was just created for us. Otherwise, if the return process ID was equal to zero, the one returned up here, then we know, okay, we got a zero, so we must be the child process. So how do we get our own process ID now? Well, it's easy. We just call the system call getPit. So in the child process, we output the same thing as above. So our process ID is now the process ID that was generated for the child process. And the parent process ID should be the process ID of the process that originally called fork. So when you compile this program, we call it fork.c and name it fork, and then we start it. So using this dot slash notation means always use it from the current directory. Current directory is abbreviated using a dot and the slash is a directory separator. So this means use it from the current directory. It first outputs that line here. So we're definitely in the parent because we haven't called forked so far. And for example, we have a process ID of 7553 and the parent of fork would have a process ID of 4104. So the parent of fork was the shell. So the shell as a process that actually executed the fork process. And then two things happen. So we execute fork, we get two copies. And so we got two lines of output. One line of output is from our newly generated child process here. So this is our new copy that went from here directly down here because our process ID was zero that was returned. So this retrieves its own process ID and its parents process ID. And you see it got a new process ID 7554. And of course, its parent is a process that we've just called. So this has 7553. And the parent process then also executes. And it sees, OK, we got a parent per, uh, process ID returned here. So it's larger than zero. So it prints I'm in the parent process. And my child process ID is obviously the same. It was just output by the child process. So we have this parent uh, and child process hierarchy here. So we have a shell with a process ID of 4014. This is a parent of 7553 because we've used the shell to create uh, to create our fork process. Then our fork process gets assigned 7553. So this is a child of 4014 and it creates uh, another process using fork. So it becomes the parent of 7554, which is then of course, 7554, the child of 7553. So if you compile this program yourself, you maybe need an include of standard io.h and unix standard.h. We'll figure this out in a bit. Uh, you get can get an output like this. Of course, the process IDs you get will differ, but you'll always have a relation between the process ID and the parent process ID between parent and child processes. One other thing that you can find out that differs is the order of the second and third line that is output here. So depending on, and you can run it multiple times, depending on this, the parent process line might come before the child process line or the other way around. So when you create a new process using fork, it is not guaranteed which process is the first one that's allowed to continue after fork. We've seen a process will be in a ready state when it's created newly. So what can happen is that after you called fork, your operating system decides after it copied your process 
that the copy of the process may come first, and this is exactly what's happening here. So you're <coughs> first getting the output of the child process, and some time later, your child process is terminated, so your parent process can continue to run, so you're getting the output that you're in the parent process. But if your parent process would run first before your child process, these lines would be exchanged. So we had fast process creation, but is it really that fast? Well, creating such a new process means we need to copy the address space. So we need to copy all the data and all the code of our program to new locations in memory. And if you have a large program, that can take quite some time. And we've seen that there's a way to call another program to start another process using the exec VE function, for example. So especially if you fork your process just to call another program immediately, then it's a complete waste of time to copy all the address space over because exec immediately would replace all the contents of your address space by the new program that was just started immediately. So it would be a complete waste of time. So for this, there's a historic solution in Unix called vfork. And vfork ensures an execution order of parent and child process. So when you use vfork instead of fork, this means that the operating system suspends the parent process that's calling vfork until the child process has called an exec function or terminated using the exit syscall. And so the child can simply use the code and data of its parent without copying. So when you use vfork, the child is just running in the same address space of the, as the parent, but of course then it's not allowed to change any data, which is difficult uh, because, for example, if you call regular exit instead of underline exit, as we've seen, this would be the libc function doing cleanup. And of course, you don't want to do all the cleanup because your parent process should continue to run in the same state. So for example, uh, the only things that you are actually allowed when you use vfork uh, that are safe to do would be to call an exec function immediately or the underline exit syscall, which immediately uh, yeah, terminates the child, but lets the parent process continue to run on the address space that was temporarily, like say, borrowed to the child, so it could use it, uh, the identical address space. Anything else would change your parent process, which is not what you want to do. Well, that's a bit inconvenient to use. So there's also a modern solution for this, and this needs some hardware support. And this solution uh, uses copy on write. So copy on write means as long as, for example, a child or a parent process only read a page of data, it's okay because we don't change any of the state. So only when a parent or a child change one of the shared pages of data we would have in our vfork, then we need to create a copy, but not a copy of the whole process, only of the page that was affected. And we've seen the MMU operating before, so we know our memory is split up into pages, like four kilobytes each, and these pages have some sort of write protection which we can enable. So if we disable write functionality, uh, then we'd actually get something we call a page fault that switches our system to the kernel. And then the kernel can see, oh yeah, the child process, for example, tried to write some data in one of these shared memory pages between parent and child. So what we're going to do is we copy this read-only page first, give our child its own copy of this four kilobyte page. So this is much faster than copying the whole address space. And then our child process can continue to write data into its now own copy of that page, whereas all the other pages that are shared can remain shared until another write occurs. So what happens when you do a fork on a copy and write system is that all data and code pages are changed to read only. So the operating system is notified whenever one of the parent or child process tries to write something to it, and as soon as a write is performed, this specific page is copied to the address space of the uh, parent or child process that performed the write, and so each has its own independent copy of that page here. So we do it page-wise, as we've seen for efficiency reasons, uh, because doing it for every single address would be too much administrative overhead. So, uh, now, when you use exec immediately after fork, you don't write anything 
to memory because you're just using a system call directly after fork and this doesn't write anything. So in the case when uh, you just do immediately call exec after fork, you don't need to have any copy on write functionality executed, but you're just throwing away, uh, well, the references to the parent's address space and create this new address space using exec by loading the new program into memory and starting it. So fork on modern systems using copy on write is almost as fast as vfork. What's actually done on the hardware level is that for our child process, the operating system sets up a new page table, so page directory and page tables, as we've seen before. And all of the entries in this page table refer to the read-only entries of the parent process to enable this copy and write functionality. The rest is in software, so there's no hardware involved except for figuring out an attempt to write to read-only page. Uh, the rest is done by the OS kernel. And of course, this is a very delicate process, so you have to take care that you do everything in the right order, in the right way, so you ensure that your data is consistent between parent and child. So the next Unix system call we've seen is exit, underline exit in this case. We've seen exit without the underline as a libc call. So exit has no return value and it gets passed an integer. So exit, well, it doesn't make sense for it to have a return value because exit doesn't return because it exits your program. So everything you write after calling underline exit, well, usually is never executed. So what exit does, it tells the operating system, please terminate the calling process. And we've seen before in our uh, first uh, theoretical examples uh, in the exercises that we actually can pass a return code to the operating system. And this return code can be passed by giving a return value using the return instruction in main. We've seen this in the theoretical exercises, but we can also pass this to underline exit. And this is an integer value and this integer value is passed to the operating system. And then when you call exit, uh, exit releases the resources allocated by the process. So open files, used memory, and then our parent process, as we've seen, parent processes can wait for the termination of a child process. Our parent process is notified using a mechanism called a signal. We'll take a look at signals later. And this signal has a name, sick child, so my child terminated. And this signal is then sent to the parent process. So the parent process is notified when it, for example, has performed some wait operation. Okay, my child has finished operating now, so I can continue doing something else. And as I already mentioned, there's also a library function, exit without the underline. And this additionally releases the resources used by the C library. So this flashes all your data still in buffers, for example, it closes your files. So normal processes should just use a libc function, exit, not the system call underline exit. Now, what can happen is if you're in such a process or hierarchy here, like you have init as a process ID one, which uh, yeah just generated the Getty process as a child, Getty created a login process, login created bash, and bash created because you typed the name of the command a Firefox command, and now. You exited the shell that started Firefox. Well, then Firefox no longer has a parent because your bash shell would no longer exist here. So what are you doing in this case? What's important is you want to keep the process hierarchy intact. So you always want to have a process you created to have some sort of parent. Now, when something like this happens, that the parent process of a process is no longer running, so it has disappeared from the system, so its parent process ID would be invalid, uh, then we say this process is orphaned because, well, it doesn't have a parent anymore. And so uh, what happens to our process hierarchy? This would no longer exist. So when uh, something like this happens, our operating system actually redirects it. So you get a foster parent, so to say, and this parent taking care of these orphan processes is the init process, which has the process ID one. So if you create a process and the parent process disappears because it was terminated or maybe it crashed or something like this, then the operating system notices this and the parent process of our Firefox process in this case would be redirected to be the init process here. So 
So our process hierarchy is still in working order, so we can control our process. We don't have any processes running wild in our system. A question for you to think about, what happens if init exits? Yeah, well, I let you find out. Uh, if you want to experiment with this, you can try this, but please do it in a virtual machine that you do, uh, can delete afterwards. So you set up uh, explicitly with a small Linux system, and then you can try as a super user to kill the process ID with process one using the Unix shell kill command and see what happens. This will be interesting. So the next system call we need to discuss when talking about processes is the wait system call. So wait can be passed a pointer to an integer and it returns a process ID. So wait, as we've already seen, blocks the calling process until one of its child process terminates. So of course you can create more than one child process by calling fork repeatedly in your program. So uh, wait actually then waits until the first child process terminates and then it returns the process ID of the child that has terminated. In case you have multiple childs created, then essentially uh, you would know which one has just terminated. And uh, we've seen that a process that terminates generates this exit status. So the parameter just passed to the exit sys call. And this exit sys call, well, it needs to return the value somewhere. The problem is that C functions only can return one value and this value was already used for returning the process ID of the child that was terminated. So we need some other way to return this exit status integer to the parent process because the parent process wants to know maybe has this child process exits, uh, exited successfully so maybe it returned a zero or was there some error which is maybe encoded as a number in your exit code. And this is why you pass an integer pointer here as this parameter because this memory address is then used by the operating system to store the result code that was generated by the child process when it terminated using exit. So you pass a pointer to an integer variable that you allocated somewhere and then the exit code of your child process is actually written into that integer variable by the operating system using that pointer. If all child processes were already terminated, wait returns immediately because there's nothing to wait for. So you can use wait like this. So uh, inside of maybe our main function we would call fork which returns the pit and we've already seen we switch between the case where pit is greater than zero so we know we're in the parent process and if pit is equals than zero so we know we're in the child process. So our child process only does one very simple thing. It calls exit and it passes a parameter of 42 as the exit code. What our uh, parent process does it first sleeps for five seconds to ensure that the child process is able to run and then it waits. So we pass a parameter of an integer pointer. So we declared an integer variable status up here. We pass its pointer using the end operator. And then we can check if the return value of our call to wait is equal to the pit that we just got returned as the pit of our child. So if it was really our child that exited, it, could, it should be because there's no other reason. And if the status actually indicates that this child has exited, because there may be other reasons to return, we'll also discuss this later, then it just prints the exit status here, which is the exit status that was just provided here when we return. So this parameter, this simple integer, is passed through the kernel when we call exit to the parent process that calls wait, and then the kernel writes this 42 inside of the status variable using the pointer that was passed. And then when we call this from our shell, we execute wait, we get, oh yeah, our parent first creates a child. We don't see anything about it because our child doesn't print anything. It just exits immediately. And then our parent process gets into control again. It figures out, yes, uh, our child has terminated and its exit status is then printed. And we got 42 again. So uh, when a process terminates, until its exit status has been requested using wait, it's in a very special state. And this is a so-called living dead state or a zombie state short in Unix. 
So uh, yes, the Unix guys like very strange uh, horror films in the cinema. So that's also why their follow-up project to Unix is called Plan 9, which is uh, inspired by one of the most horrible films of all times, Plan 9 from Outer Space. But anyways, so if a process has exited and its, par its parent hasn't noticed that yet, so it parent, its parent still thinks it's living because it hasn't executed wait and wasn't informed of, of the termination of this child process, then we call this terminated process, child process, a zombie. So the resources allocated to such processes can already be released because the process is called exit. Exit never returns. So the pro, uh, this process can never use these resources again. But the operating system process management still needs to know about these resources. And especially as we've seen, the exit status has to be saved in case our parent process decides to call, wait, and retrieves the exit status. So uh, what we can do here, the uh, we can call the example program from the previous slide here, put it directly in the background, and when we call PS immediately afterwards, because we are waiting five seconds, so if we do this fast enough in, in the first five seconds, we see a process listing that shows our bash, then our wait, which is a parent process here, then our wait child process, so it also inherits the name, but we know it's a zombie process because it has already uh, exited, but the parent process is still in its sleep function, waiting for five seconds because uh, before it calls wait. So such a zombie process is annotated with this defunct in the process listing. And then finally, five seconds later, you get the exit status of 42. So this process has already terminated. The exit status is preserved by the OS and then it's printed and then we can throw all of this information away. So when using fork, uh, we can only create identical copies of our process we've seen and we've also seen these small differences like the process and parent process ID uh, that are relevant to distinguish uh, between the cases if we are child process or parent process. So if you really want to start a different program from inside of our program, we need to use the exec system calls. There's a number of exec system calls, but the most common system call behind it is called exec VE. And this exec VE is passed a number of parameters. The most important one is a string, a constant string, so a pointer to an array of characters here. This is the command we want to execute. And this contains the name of a Unix command as we would type it on the shell. So it could be ls, for example, if we wanted to execute the ls program as a child process here uh, using exec VE. And you can also pass this a complete pass name, so you could pass slash bin slash ls. There are additional parameters, so you can pass an array of arguments and an array of environment variables to the executed programs. We are not going into details about this. So execve loads and starts the command we pass in the command parameter and execve usually does not return because it exchanges the complete address space of the process that called execve by the contents of this new program which we just want to execute. But of course sometimes problems may show up because uh, the program you're trying to execute is just not available on your system, so or you did a typo in the name of the program, or you're just not allowed to execute the program, or maybe you're running out of resources, like you're running out of memory or process IDs. So in these special cases, the exec VE system call can return uh, and then returns an error code. So what it does when it is successfully executed is it replaces the complete address space of the calling process by whatever we indicated as command, but it remains the same process. So it retains the same process ID, the same parent process ID, the same open files, the same standard IO channels, and so on. And that's important. So we're just kicking out one process and doing a complete identity change without changing really the environment the process is running in. Now exec.ve uh, has quite a large number of parameters, so libc provides some other exec functions which are just small shims around exec.ve and you can look them up in the man pages. So there's exec.l, exec.v, exec.lp and so on. All of these have their own specialized functions to make it easier for you as a programmer to use them. So how do we use our exec function here? 
So first, inside of main, we start declaring some uh, character arrays, some strings for the command and some possible arguments to a command we want to execute. And then we have like an endless loop here. This endless loop just outputs a string, please enter the command. And then we use scanf using uh, two parameters that indicate we want to read a string of maximum 99 characters, then a space and then another 99 characters for the command and the argument. Afterwards, we just call fork as before, so the process is duplicated. And uh, if we're in the parent process, then we're waiting for the child to exit. But if we're in the child process, now we're doing something different here. So as we've seen, as long as we use fork, parent and child has the same data pages and instruction pages, so they have the same variable contents here. So if we're in the child process, we still have the variable command and arg that we read using the scanf here. So the contents are the same in the parent as in the child. So we call the exec.lp function. You can look it up at the man page. So exec.lp executes this command and just passes these commands here with a terminating null to yeah, the Unix system. And the Unix system then replaces the address space of the child by the address space of the command name that was entered. And if we entered an invalid command name here, then it would just give exit fail, exec fail and return. So in any case, if this one here ends or if the exec LP actually, uh, the process we called using exec LP ends, we're informed about this using the wait system call and we can print the exit status here. So one thing we should discuss is why is this actually separate? So why is there no join function fork exec or something? This is because we want the parent process to have more control over process execution. So if we have separate calls to fork and an exec function, we can execute operations in the context of the child process, even if this code originally comes from the parent process and our child in turn gets full access to the parent process's data which means we don't have to copy things over expensively if we don't explicitly want it. And this is a feature especially used by Unix shells. For example, uh, if we do a input output redirection, the first thing a Unix shell does it is forks itself, it forks itself, then it redirects its own IO channels, and then it calls an exec to call the uh, command you uh, actually wanted to execute. So this can be used to redirect standard IO page, uh, channels and in turn, this is also used to configure pipes. We'll look at uh, some of the shell functionality and at a simple shell in later lectures. So if we consider a real world Unix system, the process model we've looked at in the beginning with just our three uh, blocked, ready and running process states was a bit simplistic. So this is a bit more complex uh, yeah, state diagram of Unix process states that may occur in a real system. So you see, whenever you call fork, a new process is first in the created state. Now, if it's in the created state, it might have sufficient memory. And if it has sufficient memory, a new process can, could start right away. So it's just waiting for the CPU, it's ready in memory. But sometimes you might not have enough main memory, so you can still create a process using fork, but it's not in main memory, so it's swap out, it's just somewhere on the disk. And what can happen then is, well, if a swapped out process, if we have enough memory free, it can be swapped in, so it's ready in memory, or a process that's ready in memory, if we're low on memory, can be swapped out to disk. So as soon as the process is ready in memory, it can be allocated to the CPU. So this would be the ready to running transition we've seen before. So this is running first in kernel mode, and then the kernel mode uh, sometimes yeah, has to actually create uh, yeah, the first user instruction. So we're switching over to our main function, we're running in user mode, and we're running in user mode as long as we don't execute a syscall or an interrupt, like a timer interrupt. Running in kernel mode would mean the kernel would then determine, okay, your time slice is used up, we have to preempt you, so our process is preempted and could be allocated again or your process could exit, so it would be a zombie, or running in kernel mode, you can also have interrupts and returns. If you're running 
uh, if you're executing a sleep call, you're in kernel mode executing a, uh, executing a sleep, you could be sleeping in memory, so when you wake up again, you're ready in memory again, or you could even be swapped out when you're sleeping in memory, so you'd have to go all through that way here to be running again. So this is a bit more complicated, you don't have to remember all of this, but just to tell you that what you read in typical textbooks, especially introductory textbooks like we have, and what's happening in the real world uh, is a bit different because the real world has just more requirements to fulfill what's needed to build a real world operating system. So to conclude, process management, as we've seen here, is an important part of any operating system. We've seen Unix implements a process hierarchy, which uh, at the top of the hierarchy is usually the init process with a process ID of one. And Unix takes a very special approach to process management because it separates the creation of processes from the execution of processes. And this is used by the Unix shell to implement I.O. redirection and for many other things. And we've seen a small set of basic system calls is used for process management. And uh, we need hardware support for copy and write to make fork efficient. And finally, we've seen that in the real world, in the real Unix system, this uh, hierarchy diagram or the state diagram of process uh, states can be quite complex. So that's all for today. Uh, here's some references if you're interested. So the first two are about the history of Unix. So the first one by Peter Sellers was written after a quarter of century uh, of Unix, so in 1995. And uh, the second one by Brian Kernigan, Unix, a history and a memoir, uh, was published after about 50 years of Unix. If you're interested in Unix system level programming, there's one really re standard reference textbook by uh, um, Stevens and Rago, Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment, uh, which is a thousand pages book on all things Unix, which describes all the simple cases, but of course, all the complexities. Uh, and there, this is valid for, for all the Unix systems uh, out there, and they usually give indications if there's any functionality in one of the Unix systems like Mac OS X that might be different. Uh, the original papers describing the Unix systems are here, so by Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson. So they first described Unix in communications of the ACM in 1974. And then there's also a retrospective paper by Dennis Ritchie, uh, written several years later, uh, which you can access there. So that's all for today. Thanks for listening, and until next time. Bye.